Good morning. We're starting a new series today. It's entitled, we have the graphic. I love that graphic. The Difficult Ones. Living in peace and victory in the midst of painful people. So if you've never had that experience, you might want to head home right now and, and get an early lunch. But for those of us that have ever had to deal with difficult people, um, how many know that you're difficult too? That, that's part of the, the, the solution to dealing with difficult people is ourselves. But that's for another week. This week, we're going to be looking at the relationships that are difficult and painful in our lives. You know, there was a study where wisdom was gleaned over 75 years. In fact, it's the longest psychiatric study uh, ever conducted, as far as I know. And it started before World War II, and it ended in 2014. And they took a group of men, uh, poor men, and they took a, and it was conducted by Harvard. And I'll tell you a little, I'll read a little bit about that. But it was conducted by Harvard University, and they chose a group of poor Bostonians, and the other group they chose was a well-educated Harvard graduate, and they were men. And they studied them over 75 years in different ways, from brain scans when those became, uh, you know, in, available, and blood tests. And so they looked at the physical, they looked at the emotional, they looked at the experience, and the, the idea was to find out what makes someone in their life feel they've had a good life. What are the ingredients for that? And so they, they did all this study, and I'll just read a little bit to you. It's the, it was called the Grant and Gluck study, and it tracked the physical and emotional well-being of two populations, 456 poor men growing up in Boston from 1939 to 2014, and 268 male graduates from Harvard's class of 1939 to 1944. Due to the length of the research period, this has required multiple generations of researchers. Since before World War II, they've diligently analyzed blood samples, conducted brain scans once they became available, and poured over self-reported studies as well as actual interactions with these men to compile their findings. The conclusion, according to Robert Waldinger, director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development, one thing surpasses all the rest in terms of importance and well-being, of well-being. He states the clearest message that we get from this 75 year study is this, good relationships keep us happy and healthier, period. According to George Valiant, the Harvard psychiatrist who directed this study during the years 1972 to 2004, he says there are two foundational elements to this happy and healthier relationships. One is love, and the other is finding a way of coping with life that does not push love away. And one of the key aspects in difficult people is they push love away from them. They want love, but they are motivated to protect themselves so they keep it away. And so we're going to look at that today and look at some of the characteristics of difficult people because what we tend to get caught up in is the behavior. People are always motivated to behave. So when we get caught up in the behavior, we tend to not be able to actually minister to where they're at in their own being. We take it personal. And that's the other aspect. When you take people's behavior personally, you will respond defensively, and the person that is trying, that is difficult, is trying to get acceptance. They, they are motivated to have worth, to find acceptance, to be important. They are motivated by things that lack in them. They just go about it the wrong way, and so they create this turmoil. You know, nobody ever enters into a relationship and says, you know what, I'm glad you're having a relationship with me, but I just want you to know I'm a tornado. I, I throw everything around me. We always enter a relationship not being difficult until we get to know that person. Then we begin to see, oh, the things that take place. How many thought somebody was amazing until you got to know them? 
And when I was young in ministry, when, you know, I would tell this, this person is a, oh, this person is going to help us. He's going to, you know, he or she's going to do this. We're going to just, oh my gosh, we are so blessed. <laughs> Whenever you say you are so blessed, I would not even say that. <laughs> I'm saying I'm glad God brought this person into my life for some reason. And then go from there. Listen, the good part is we're not the only ones that had difficult relationships. In three of the Gospels, it's recorded by the writers that Jesus, speaking of his disciples, after the crazy part, let me give you a tiny bit of context here. Jesus had sent out his disciples according to Luke in chapter 6. They came back with all this great input about what God has done, and, and, and they were out there. Then Jesus takes a couple of his disciples up onto a mountaintop, transfigures before them. They actually see him in his godlike state, and they're blown away. Not only that, they see Elijah and Moses too, and then he goes down the mountain, and this guy comes up to him and says, oh, my gosh, my kid has a demon. He is demon-possessed, and your disciples, which means the other apostles, the other disciples who were down the mountain, didn't see what Jesus showed these guys, couldn't cast the devil out. And you know what Jesus says to his guys? He says this, verse 41 of chapter 9 in Luke. He says, you unbelieving and perverse generation... How long shall I stay with you and put up with you? In other words, these people are difficult. These are, di these are his, his disciples, his A-team. And he says, you're perverse and you're unbelieving. What does that mean? Unbelieving means they can't grasp what he's telling them. They're rejecting the information he has been telling them for how, for the X amount of time he has been with them. They have been resistant to receive that input, which means the other input they have in their lives, their other perspectives on life, that's what they're holding on to. And that's always the clash that goes on in our mind that precedes change is what am I going to believe? And then he tells them you're perverse. One of the root definitions of perverse is stubborn. It's headstrong. You're running the show. You're stubborn to take input. Dif that sums up in a nutshell difficult people. They believe their perception is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and they don't know what motivates them. They're most of the time not sure why they're difficult. They think it's everybody else's issue. And usually they're headstrong and stubborn and don't take input. So what is going on in that situation? What is happening? Well, we want to take a look at that today. Why are some people, the sabotaging Sam, complaining Kathy, passive-aggressive Pete, and just about any group, any group you find, you got them characters. One of our ways of dealing with this, hopefully we'll get into a group that doesn't have them. And we, that's why sometimes we isolate out. We just can't find somebody who isn't jacked up. And, and, but the crazy part is we don't think we are because we're stubborn and hard-headed, and we tend to believe what we tend to believe is really what it, what's really going on. So, why are some people so difficult to work with or live around or even be around? You know what tends to happen when you're around difficult people? You avoid them. You ever notice that? You know when you come into church and you say, <clears throat> And these are God's kids who we're supposed to love. You know, we, we tend to move away. Somebody offends us. And we, first of all, we, we, you know, if we're the gossiping type, which we aren't, but if you were, <laughs> we want to get vengeance. One of, the ways, one of the reasons people gossip and slander is to right a perceived wrong. And so we go do that. And then the next tendency is, to avoid them. 
So we do the opposite of what God says. And James deals with this in chapter 3, starting with verse 14. He speaks of two things that are pretty much the headline, pretty much the apex of every other problem we have relationally. He says this, but if you harbor, word harbor, think of Huntington, Newport Beach, the harbor. A harbor is a place where a ship anchors and finds safe resting place. He says, if you harbor, and he's going to name them here in a second, in your heart. These have become settled in your heart. He says, this is what you need to do about it. So he says, if you harbor bitter envy, jealousy, you see what someone has, and your perspective of it is they shouldn't really have that. There's something about that. And, and the other side of that coin is, I should. I should be in that spot. I should be looking at He goes, if you harbor that as an attitude. Some of us in here today, you took people's inventory as soon. That's why you gotta, some of you got to sit in front. Because if you're sitting back, every person that walks in, oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, look at who they think they are. You don't even have to know them. Look at you just got, you're just right there. And see, in our minds, we think we have the gift of critique. <laughs> we think somehow that that's a strength we possess. <laughs> oh, I got discernment. I know the way people are. But he says, if you harbor envy and selfish ambition. So what's selfish ambition? I am wanting to rise up. But the motive behind it isn't to rise up to bless. It's to rise up to be okay, to feel worthwhile, to be perceived of someone, as someone of value. He goes, if you, have, if you harbor this, this is a motivating factor in your life. What's he say to do about it? Don't boast about it. And... Boast about it or deny the truth. In other words, be open to hear and be open to be self-aware. One of the big problems with difficult people is they think their difficulty is a strength. Hey, when I go into a relationship, nobody's pushing me around. I just want to make that crystal clear. I'm boasting about that. Oh, I've been hurt by guys before. God, help that next woman. She ain't going to hurt me. Oh, no. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm closed off. Or we deny it. That's not me. Hey, how come everywhere you go, you have problems with people? No, I don't. No, it's, it's obvious. You always have problems with people. I've only known you this long, and everybody around you has got an issue with you. No, they don't. That's not right. They're just not right. They're jealous. That's our big issue. And then he says this about it. Such wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. So he's saying this knowledge, this way of doing stuff that you've applied as wisdom to yourself, you gained it from somewhere. Everybody does things from some place. If we are not aware of our motivations, we, we don't know why what's happening is happening. And that's why we're prone to keep reliving it. He says, listen, such wisdom does not come down from heaven. And remember here, James is writing to believers. He says, such wisdom that causes bitter envy and selfish ambition does not come from God. Why? Because when you are tied into the wisdom of God, you are knowing the information you have is you are loved. That God's got a purpose for you. That he died for you, cares for you. That his plan is good for you. It's meant to prosper you and bring you a future. It's, meant, it's a good thing. And so you don't view people as competition. And when God elevates someone else, it isn't because you're being de-elevated. That make a sense? De-elevated? That's a new word. I'm keeping it. I'm going to get a domain name. And uh, 
Don't steal it. <laughs> It'll make me important. <laughs> We will feel like we're moving back. And, some, and a lot of us have had that. When someone's moving forward, we feel like we're moving backward. Even though it has nothing to do with us, it does. Because I have selfish ambition. I'm, I'm always competing. That came from somewhere. And he says this, that does not come from heaven, but is earthly. It has been handed to you. It has been your experience. You grew up in it. It has been generationally passed down to you. This knowledge that I got to fend for myself. If everybody in your family was fending for themselves, you begin to, you are motivated that I have to win. I have to win. And winning looks like I'm ahead. And if I'm ahead, that means somebody's losing. So if they're winning, I by default have to be losing. And they don't even know we're in a competition. So what does that make me? That makes me jealous of them. I'm envious. Why do they? Heck, when I was early in my recovery, I was like, why do they get to drink? <laughs> and I don't. How can they do, have, how can they do cocaine and still go to work? <laughs> that is just not right. And that's just one area. I had it for everything. If you succeeded, you had fairy dust sprinkled on you. Somehow you just got it. You had all, oh, you had the right connections. Oh, you had this, you had that. Uh, you know, one of the great attributes of a, of a, a difficult person is victimhood. Anyway, we'll get into that. So far, so fun, huh? Good times. <laughs> he says, listen, it is earthly, it comes from your world that you grew up in. It comes from your lifestyle. It comes from when you were itty bitty and all the way through. And then he says this, it's unspiritual. It's grounded from earthly perspectives. Paul tells us in Corinthians, he says, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Well, he says this, he says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the earth. God's kids can oftentimes fight with the weapons of the earth, which is getting victory, which is overpowering, which is dominating, all the different things in the earth. Conniving, stealing, lying, cheating, working around, all those things. He says that wisdom that causes selfish ambition, trying to climb the ladder so I'll be okay, trying to be, and then if I'm not climbing the ladder, I'm feeling like I'm being held down and I'm going to find out who's doing, and then I'm envy and je envious and jealous of them. And I have to do something about that. He says that's one, it's of the earth. Two, it's unspiritual. You do not have the eyes of God. You do not have the perspective of God. And remember, these are God's kids he's writing to. You can, be a God, you can be a child of God and not live like it. Your spirit belongs to God. It's inhabited by the Holy Spirit. But your body, the way you walk is according to this. And the way you think is damaged. He says, listen. And then he goes this. Then he says, spiritual, demonic. There's a spiritual enemy that's involved here. That's, I, I believe, God, a lot of us walk around because we're being attacked, like Chris was saying earlier today, being attacked by the enemy, and we don't know we're being attacked. And so we're looking at people as attacking us. My problem is, and the enemy knows where you're weak. He knows where you're jealous. He knows where there's woundedness. You've got a history. Hey, let me tell you something about the enemy. He's seen all the revivals. He's seen all the moves of God through history. Your story, you ain't informing him of nothing that he hasn't seen already. And he hasn't developed strategies against. He's developed strategies over the X amount of time against men. He knows strategies. You're not going to out-strategize him. What the scripture says is we become aware of his methods to mess with us, his schemes. That's what we're not ignorant of. He's got a strategy. So he uses that against us. So we in the natural, we're up against it. That's why we can't win in any area of our life when we fight the natural with the natural. We can't win it. 
And what does he say the big problem is with them? They are unaware. And then he says this, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder, chaos, and what? Every evil practice. That's why I said he sums it up in a couple sentences. We're dealing with something. Look at the jealousy and the envy going on. And the selfish ambition, trying to get a position of power, prestige, position, whatever it is, so I'll be okay. He says everything else flows on that. That's why I'll climb the ladder any which way it takes to climb the ladder, because once I get to that ladder, I'll be okay. Once I get to the top of the ladder, I look down on everybody else, and they have to look up to me, and now I am somebody. <laughs> Not that I've ever done that. <laughs> but why? See, and this is the thing. Envy and jealousy are based on the belief that somebody possesses something you should. You should have. Therefore, they should be knocked down. Therefore, you need to find the weakness. Therefore, you need to find the flaw in them. So that that can be exploited so that they don't think they're that big a deal and maybe you get it maybe there's something that will make you okay listen and all of that all of that what i just said motivates you to selfish ambition the desire to achieve so we find love now when you have to fight for that that means you have to fight against something. And when it becomes people, places, and things, it's a problem. It, one of the, for an example, in my, my, my life, I, see, I know how to live the secret life. I was molested as a kid. I know how to keep compartments of my life. And then I did drugs and sell dope. And, you know, I had compartments I kept secret. I know how to live that life. But there was something inside of me that always wanted to be honest and wanted to have transparency and wanted to have that. But I, I, I didn't know how to do that. And this is the problem when we don't look at our motivations, we don't fix them. Difficult people do not know how to operate in calm situations. So what they do is they create problems because that's what they're used to living in. So they have learned all the skills you need to deal in chaos, to deal in upheaval. What they haven't developed is the skills to live in peace. So when they come into an environment that is peaceful, they are uncomfortable. That's why you'll see couples, you know, attract, you know, hey, I, I've talked to numerous women. I'm attracted to the bad boy. So what you're telling me, why are you, why are you attracted to the bad boy? What makes you attracted to the bad boy? Well, because it's, 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 a, you know, it's exciting. No, what you mean is you're on a tent, you're on a constant anxiety adrenaline pump because you don't know what's going on because crazy, I don't know what he's doing. So now, and, and I'm used to this chaos and I got to create this chaos because I'm comfortable with it. And I call normal guys that are stable, boring. So boring. They go to work. We, they go eat at restaurants. I'm not big into food. I'm big into anxiety and fear so I don't eat. I, you know, I like, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, they got money. Hey, they do this thing that some people call vacation. <laughs> I don't get that. Why we didn't do vacations. And so we are, we, uh, he says, listen, all the disorder comes because you're not aware of what motivates you. And if you're unwilling you cannot change anything, so we're doomed to repeat it again. And th we want it. See, for an example, I desperately wanted to be loved and accepted. And that's really the bottom line that we're all looking for. In the chaos, we're looking for that. I wanted to be loved, but 
when Teresa and I got together, I would not hold her hand in public. I would not hold her hand. I am not going to look like I need a woman. <laughs> Inside, I'm crying out for love, but I'm pushing her away because she's interpreting that. What's the problem? You weren't that way last night. <laughs> we seem to be on the same page last night. What? And then now they're guessing at the behavior. Why is he acting? What? What's the deal? You know, and, and, and all this stuff. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the way I'm thinking is a good thought. Because if you depend on them, they can hurt you, and I can't take the pain, so I am difficult. I push away before I get pushed away. Because that's what I learned. Do you trust people, they hurt you. So you never give too much. Let alone put my arm around her. Are you crazy? That, that tripped me out. I don't know if any other guys have ever dealt with that. Any other guys? One? Okay, I'm the sickest. But we do things that hinder. And until we get to the place of saying, God, help me. Now, this is, we'll talk about the individual. I'm kind of talking about the individual right now. But you're going to run into people that operate that way. If you look at the behavior, you're going to be highly offended. You're going to be, it's going to be a, abrasive to you. What, what we need to be able to do is to look beyond the behavior and you know, see what's going on underneath. And, and I'll give you a couple ways to do that. But let's just, before we get there, um, thank you. I want to give you a couple attributes of difficult people. <sighs> difficult people create problems. Not because there are always real problems, but because that's how they function well. Their people skill set is based on and learn from trouble. So they have to have that going on. There always have to be issues going on. That's the way they do that. So you're seeing a behavior in that person, and it's, okay, what, what is going on? They're creating problems that aren't necessarily there. Another aspect of difficult people is they are self-sabotaging, like I was with trees. They want to be loved, but can't receive love. They keep it away but they desperately want it. So they do things to keep intimacy in locked quarters. I never saw my mom and dad be affectionate to each other. Maybe, well, maybe a couple times ever growing up. They fought, way, and that was just my experience or my perception. They fought way more than I ever saw them communicate. There was always tension, always tension. And yet they had eight kids. And my mom even told me, oh, your dad behind closed doors, your dad. <laughs> so what message does that send to a kid like me? Oh, and then being molested, oh, they have a secret life that isn't displayed outwardly. Oh, so secret lives are the way you ought to live. Secret life, and don't express your feelings. You love each other, but we never actually, I, I never actually see that. So I'm guessing what that looks like, and I think a lot of guys are that way. Love is sex. And when that's done, I'll see you, when's the next time? We'll meet again. I'm not saying everybody. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they get up here and, you know, I say, you know, Joe, can you get the point across in a different way? <laughs> Difficult people are very defensive and perceive any critique as an attack on their value as a person. So they collect stamps on others. When you're around somebody and they're very defensive, 
They cannot take any input because to them, you're not talking about an issue. Hey, honey, can we talk about this issue uh, right here that we got going between us right here? Can we talk about that person perceives it, whether it's at work or whatever. You are no good loser. There's nothing of value in you. And so they, they can't take that because they're already full. That's the reason they try to do all this stuff and manipulate and change people. Their idea is if I come in and can change you to be the person I need you to be, one, I'll be valuable. And if you could just do that, and we'll be okay. I'll be loved. I will have, I will have importance. I will have matter. So we go around trying to change everybody to, so that we'll be okay. And get them, see, if they look at it my way, then I got knowledge. I've, I, you know, I, I'm a valuable person here. Does that make sense? Difficult people always feel like they have to fight for something. I'm fighting for my position. I'm fighting to be recognized. When you hear somebody says, I'm a fighter, it's like, okay. So every place is a ring to you. I go to work, I gotta climb in the ring. I go to hang out with the family, I gotta climb in the ring. We're gonna battle. Somebody's gotta win, which always makes somebody gotta lose. And the whole thing of working and, and you know, being at peace as, as far as possible is not something we're used to. Their skill set was base was was developed in trauma, trouble, heartache. Another thing about dif difficult people, they view themselves as being victims, being persecuted. They're always the victim, and what they tend to do is 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 have an overdeveloped sense of protecting people. I'm protecting the underdog. Now, the underdog needs to be protected sometimes, but it's overdeveloped. I remember when I got my first ministry job at the mission, and, and the staff, you know, staff's job is to coordinate, develop, plan, uh, raise up, help these people become functioning citizens and, and Christians. And so we had numerous things set up. I looked at rules a lot of times as persecution on the poor guy. We'd have a staff meeting, and, and one of the staff would bring up Bobby so-and-so. This dude is a problem. He's causing all kinds of issues in the program. He's doing this. My job? Oh, persecuting the underdog, eh? I got to defend Bobby. Hey, Bobby's a good guy. Bobby is this, and Bobby is that, and we need to be kind to Bobby, and we, you know, we need to do this, and we need to do that. And so I became their lawyer which put me at a disadvantage with the people that were paying me and trying to run this thing, I was, in as nice a way as I could, subverting it. Oh, yeah, yeah, when that guy's around. This is me helping, helping a guy that's already got massive authority issues. You don't get to live at the mission. You don't get to be a dope fiend because you go with the flow of the law. You got authority issues going way back, a lot of times abused authority, yada, yada, yada. And that's legitimate. My thing was I would undermine what, we, what these guys and staff or the organization spent a lot of time trying to put structure on and help things. I would undermine it by saying, yeah, when that guy's around. And I did this kind of stuff in the name of Jesus, helping people. When that guy's around, don't act like that. Don't smoke when that guy's around. He'll rat on you. I'm a staff guy. That's a staff guy. <laughs> yes, I'm winning friends and influencing people. <laughs> not knowing, not even believing that this guy was not going to manipulate and massage that. And oftentimes, two weeks into the program, he bailed. 
And the staff's looking at me like, yeah. And I'm looking at that. Now, now, wow. I just got used in a good way. This guy is super unstable. And he's going to use me too. I had to, you ever have this feeling, sometimes you guys that are, have difficult people, you, you have issues with every kind of authority because you're, you're, the, you're the savior of the, 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 the lostest child. If they're super lost, that's who I'm attracted to. Why? Because your stuff hasn't been dealt with. So you resonate with that person in their rebellion, but you have no capability to get them out of it because you're still limping in it. So your perspective is authorities. If, if that guy's perspective is authorities jacked up and your perspective is authority jacked up, how are you going to help him get over that? It's like having your, some of us talk about, you know, well, you know, my girlfriends say this about this guy and my girlfriend said, how's your girlfriend's relationships? Oh, no, she's been divorced four times. So you're getting advice <laughs> relationally for someone that can't keep a relationship. What kind of advice are you going to get from that? That's what Scripture calls tickling your ears. How have you recovered? Hey, here's a question I like to ask people. How have you recovered from that? Because going through that stuff, there's, there's a lot of legitimate reasons. There's a lot of legitimate stuff going on. What have you recovered from that? Tell me, tell me where you're different so the next chick doesn't become number five or the next guy doesn't become number five. Tell me what it, how you have grown through that. How are you heavenly minded right now? And that's why Chris was saying, get into the word, get into the word. I cannot be heavenly minded if I spend no time being in the heavenlies. You can't do it. I want to get in shape, but I detest the gym. I want to lose weight, but I got to have my nine meals a day. I eat for comfort. Well, you probably need to figure out a different way to comfort yourself. See, that's why I don't like you judging me now. You sit there and you judge me. No, I'm not judging you. I like you. I'm just asking you in the realm of comfort, what could you do differently to meet that same need but not beat yourself up afterwards. Because a lot of times, we're our own most difficult person. I keep doing, as Paul would say, what I don't want to do. So I'm at constant war with myself. I'm looking for you to make me valuable. Hey, one of the things God allows us to be is self-valuable. I'm a worthy person. I'm worthy to be treated this way. My body's worthy to be treated a particular way. I'm a worthy person. I will not be around places where I am demeaned and trashed, but I know I'm going to be difficult. I'm going to be around difficult people. So God, how do we deal with difficult people? How do that's the that's the crux. How do I deal with them? Because in the flesh we want to avoid them or we want to get some kind of we want justice. Difficult people have a high level of neediness, or in psych terms, codependence. They, are need, they have a desperate need for love and affection, for a feeling of value. And I know I've hammered that about 20 times so far. You need to understand that. When you're around somebody that's causing difficulty in, in, in the situation you're in, there's a need for them to to feel validated, to feel important. It's, they're desperate for it. But the reason they join or want to be a part of this or, or become part of that is, is to make them better, not to really be an asset to it. So what do you do? Well, the first thing you have to exercise is forgiveness. You have to have what, what Jesus said in, in Luke when he was talking to his, his disciples. He said, you have to be merciful as your father is merciful. The word mercy has at its root, it has the idea of forgiveness. You have to realize, and forgiveness has to do with not taking it personally. 
That person is acting out of their stuff. It's not my stuff. There's always a grain of truth in that, so I have to be open to get the grain of truth of it. What are they saying? What, 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 what is it that I can receive? But most of it is I have to be willing to not give them what they deserve. So what's the second part of that? I think Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 5.14 kind of sums it up. Um, it says this, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle. Admonish has the idea of speaking the truth. In order for me to be merciful to you and you're causing disruption, I can address the behavior or I can say, hey, you know what? I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate that input. Hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we get together? You know what? I'd like to hear your story. I'd like to hear where you come from. I don't know you very well. Why don't we get together and, and, and break bread and, and just kind of talk? I'd like to spend a little time with you. I like to know that. That alone, why? Because the person's underlying desire in their weird behavior is to be loved and accepted, is to find worthiness. So how do you meet that? I'm telling you, you're worthy. You're worthy to be hung out with. And I'd like to hang out with you. And, and you know, we can talk about that, but I'd also like to get to know you. He says, admonish the idol. Another word for idol is stuck. People that are difficult oftentimes don't realize they're stuck. They're stuck in that. Why? Their perception is it, and they're not self-aware. Then it has the idea of speaking the truth. What, what does that mean? Well, speak the truth. Hey, you know, I've kind of noticed that you, you, you came into this and you got a lot of problems. You know, I'm kind of thinking you've probably got some issues revolved around that. Lunch is over. <laughs> That's why you want to wait after lunch and they pay. But uh, <laughs> you want to invest in them. And this is the key. You're worthy to be invested in. You're worthy to be invested in. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll take that step in. Because if I don't, my, ne my tendency is going to be, I won't be around you know, I don't, nah, you know, that person's an idiot. And, uh, you know, it, or rebuke them. And, and the law can always quit, cut quick. Building someone up, to, and that's the next thing Paul says. Admonish them, speak the truth. Hey, you might be the, and what's it say? Encourage them. Because you know, when you talk to somebody about their story, you're going to see underlying motivations in their life. I grew up, I never felt love. I grew up in a foster home. I grew up in this kind of thing. Well, you know, nobody ever talked to my family. You know, I, you know, whatever their story is, you begin to put pieces together and how they operate. People operate from a place. You need to get that. Nobody just, hey! You know, they, and oftentimes we don't know where. They don't know where. They're not self-aware of where they operate. And they might even boast you know, I've learned in relationships, you need to, and they, they name four things that are relationship tearing up, you know, damaging. You can ask them, hey, why do you think that's a good thing? Why, why, why would you do that? You know, I, I told her. What are you trying to accomplish by telling her? What, what, what's the goal here? Well, I want her to treat me right. Okay, so you want to be loved. Do you think there's any other ways you can go about that? What way you go? And most people, you ask them options, they give you one or two options. Well, I don't want to leave her. And what else can you? That's one option. What's another option? I don't, don't say nothing. Okay, we like to call that storing for another day. Putting it in the file cabinet because it's going to come out. That is an option. What's another option? That enables them to start looking at stuff differently. Because I'll tell you what, the people in your life that are difficult, you're not the only one they're difficult with. They're not. Unless you are the extremely difficult one. 
And they go, no, we get along with everybody except you. <laughs> I'll find out if that's true. He says this, encourage. Give them courage to try to do something differently. You know, well, what our theme here in this church is to build lives one at a time. And, and, and the idea is that we just take one person and spend all our time. The idea is that building lives is a messy process. Then the, third, the, the next one is what? It takes time and encourage. Help them. Help them. Hey, can we do it again? You know, hey, why don't you call me next time you and so-and-so or you and your wife are tripping out or, or maybe we need to get somebody in here. You know, hey, call me and, and, and talk to me before you do something that you're going to regret because you always say to me, you regret that. You know, I regret what I did. I stepped in it again. Well, you know what? Next time before you step in it, can you zip and make a phone call? How about that? How about praying about it? How about saying, God, show me what they're motivated. Show me what's going on here. Because don't, you know, don't, if I take it personal, then I'm going to respond the way I've learned. And most of the time, it ain't heavenly. <laughs> and then the, the, the fourth one is patience. He says, listen, we urge you, brothers, admonish the idols, speak the truth, encourage the faint-hearted, encourage those who are struggling. I'm struggling here. I'm, I'm, I have a conflict everywhere. Encourage them. Help the weak. Help the ones that don't know other ways. And then the last one, be patient with them all. Be patient. People take time to process and to change, even the best among us. And part of patience is sometimes just praying for them. Just praying for those people that you see are difficult. And you know what? If you pray for somebody, you naturally start to draw toward them. And, you know, and, and let me put a cavit in here, or I think that's the right word. Anyway, I, I tried to sound intelligent right there. <laughs> Hope it came across that way. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes I'm not talking about dangerous people. I'm not talking about people, you know, some people we need to be away from. That's wisdom. That is great wisdom. I'm talking about your everyday difficult people that are basically good people. They're just difficult. They, uh, they, they are motivated from stuff that most time they don't understand. And they are unwilling. Your prayer for them is that they would be teachable. That stubborn heart. That self-will. I know the best way to heal myself. I know the best way to fix this relationship is for her to get her act together. And thank God I'm in her life because I can remind her daily. <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> Be patient with them. So, all right, why don't we stand up? I know some of you in here have had people run through your head who you need to forgive. Not, not forgive, who are difficult. Right now, we want to take a moment, forgive them. So just close your eyes. I'll lead you in a prayer. You can say it in your own heart. But Lord, I forgive this difficult person. Lord. And you, can, uh, you don't have to name them out loud because that would be <laughs> awkward for some of us. <laughs> I forgive them for their, their, their difficult attitudes, their difficult ways, the way they, they cause strife and, and, and they, they want to live chaotically. They want to live in a in a fight zone all the time. I forgive them for that. And Lord, I pray for them now in those deep motivations, those places in them that are wounded and they really want to be loved and they really want, the, they don't know their value. They're trying to find it. They're fighting for it. They're looking for it. They, they don't understand. They're not okay within themselves. God, help me to, to be able to bridge that gap a little bit to be able to love them in the midst of it, to be able to be, treat them as people and not just as problems. And Lord, help me to realize, even in my own life, to be aware of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Be self-aware. And is it coming from heaven? Or is it of the things of my life, my, my earthly life, and, and, and what, the, what has come down to me generationally, and also what the enemy is involved? I come against that enemy. And I bind him in the name of Jesus, the enemy of strife and the enemy of uh, 
uh, judge, judgment and 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 uh, vict- uh, the end the, the the spirit of envy and the spirit of self uh, ambition, selfish ambition. I, I renounce those things in the name of Jesus. I bind them together. I cast you out, and I ask God that you would now pour into me a spirit of peace, a spirit of joy, that you would give me a greater discernment to see why I act the way I do and why others act the way they do. And you'd give me a love that overlooks a fault. And that you would provide a door that they can be reached. Provide in people a hunger to to grow, to be more, to be heavenly minded. Create in us, God, a hunger to be more heavenly minded. Give us a hunger for the things of heaven that we may be filled so that we can deal with the things of earth from a full cup, not from fumes. Help us, God, that we may love the difficult ones in such a way that it is beneficial to them. Help us to pray up before we deal with the difficult people. Help us to set good boundaries that we don't get sucked in to the drama. So we thank you for that. Use us, God, to to be a, a healing balm to the people in our lives, especially the difficult ones, especially the people we'd want to run away from. And we want to be merciful, God, like you are towards us. And God, we acknowledge that we're difficult ones too. So help us, God. And help us to receive from others what we need to receive that we may grow and not be defensive. And all God's kids who agree, say amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.